The name of this is going to be uh, Spinal Hygiene, Preventing Back Surgery. Um, just general ideas about, uh, you know, improving spinal hygiene um, in order to prevent having surgery and basically making sure that you stay as healthy as you can. Um, so the thing I always go through when we have one of these little videos is I always uh, do a little bit of talk here about myself and about why I go through and I talk about this. Um, I'm a chiropractor. I've been practicing for almost 20 years now. Um, you know, it's like a little bit shy, a couple of years shy of it, but still it's, uh, you know, I've been doing it for a while. Um, I have a whole bunch of different certifications. Uh, you can see by the alphabet soup that's behind my name. Um, it's not common for people in the area to uh, be a board certified functional neurologist or to have a board certification or a diplomate in much of anything. Um, when it comes down to it, this uh, DACNB, that is the Diplomate of the American Chiropractic Neurology Board. So um, it, there's not very many chiropractors that have those kind of certifications. Um, the second one is a certification that gives me a specialty in sports medicine. So I have a handful of different things. I also do um, am a corrective exercise specialist. So there's a handful of different things that I do when it comes to exercise. So obviously this is fairly important. So. Now, when it comes to how that works is that the exercises and stuff like that are important for spinal hygiene. So most um, people aren't quite aware of it, but you know, uh, I won't go too crazy on statistics here, but when it comes to it, about 80% of the population suffers from back pain. Okay. And that's obviously like a huge percentage. Um, there's all kinds of different, you know, things about, you know, and that's, 80% of the population just in general, there's a certain percentage per year that gets it. So it, there's a whole lot of people that end up getting low back pain at, at some point in, in their lives. Um, but of the people that do get back pain, there's only about 5% of the population that actually is a good candidate for surgery. Um, you have to be careful because people will, you know, it depends on the surgeon and some surgeons by don't, don't, don't get me wrong here. Some surgeons are obviously going to be really, really good about making sure that they're only taking tough cases or cases that are definite surgical cases. But there are some times where people will get jumped right to surgery where it's not necessarily the best option for the people in general, right? So the, the general idea is, is that you want to make sure that people are a good candidate for back surgery. Um, and again, the, of the 80% of the population who gets back pain, there's only 5% that actually has back surgery or should have back surgery. So if that's the case, you know, if you take, you know, 95% of 80, that's about 76% of the population. 76% of the population has low back pain, but they're not really a good candidate to get it. And that's not talking at any one time, that's talking in general. But again, what happens with that other 75%, you know, 76% of the population that shouldn't have surgery, but you know, they still had low back pain, what kind of stuff should they do? There's certain things that you can do in order to help to resolve low back pain. Um, obviously, you know, we'll talk a little bit about some conservative care stuff, but this is things to resolve it, but then there's other things that you can do in order to prevent it in the first place. So the thing is, is that again, if 80% of the population has back pain, again, that means that it's really, really common, but that's not normal. People don't typically have low back pain. You're not, I should say people do on a semi-regular basis, but you're not supposed to have low back pain, right? That's not like a, a normal thing that, that you're supposed to have. Like there, there's issues that come down to it. Something went wrong if you're having low back pain. Um, so again, the general idea is that you want to try to discover like effective natural types of spinal hygiene strategies in order to help to resolve back pain and maybe prevent you from having a surgery. So when it comes to certain things about surgeries is, is that about 25% 
of spinal surgeries are going to result in more instability or problems that are afterwards. So again, let's be clear. Like again, some people need surgery. Um, the people that do, they, um, you know, oftentimes the, the main thing that gets better is the pain that like shoots down a leg, right? Or if it's neck surgery, if you have pain that's basically like going down your arm or something like that, those have the tendency to get a lot better. So sciatica has the tendency to really, really get better, but the back pain itself doesn't. And if you don't have a good candidate that is getting surgery for the right reasons, then the reason that they would be getting better isn't going to be as good as what it should be. So the general idea is, is that um, you, you want to try to avoid obviously having surgery if you don't need it, but people that do have surgery end up having increased instability on occasion. And sometimes that's going to lead to increased pain. And sometimes that leads to an increased need for surgery. So the pain not only happens, um, you know, it, it's not the only problem that's there is the increased pain. You can also get more spinal degeneration. So degeneration, the wear and tear that you get on the spine, those are things that you can get that can progress and they can get worse. So these, you know, changes that you can see on x-rays, they're going to be most likely to occur above the level of like where a person has a fusion. Um, you know, people that get fusions are going to be about twice as likely to, um, get spinal degeneration than somebody who doesn't get a fusion. So, and even the people that do have relief after the, the surgery, sometimes they'll have, you know, uh, basically they'll have changes in the way that the spine moves afterwards, right? Regardless of whether or not they have a fusion or not, but definitely if they have a fusion. So again, there's multiple different things. Again, more spinal degeneration will occur in, the, in someone's spine post-surgery. And it ends up being this thing that ends up being difficult because again, like the, the difficult thing for me is that I do work for the state. So for the state of Ohio, I do spinal exams and, and other kinds of exams on injured workers that had been hurt before. They might have seen a chiropractor before, they might not have. And then when you get done with that process, there's basically something that's called a permanent partial disability exam. And I do some of the exams on these people. So it's somebody who, you know, like it might be that they had something simple like a sprain strain and that was it. Other people are people that might have had something that was more serious, but you see a lot of people that down the line end up having procedure after procedure after procedure, but they don't necessarily like improve. It's kind of like, you know, it's not everybody because there's plenty of people who go in these pathways and don't come out and, and have problems, but there's a lot of people that We'll start off and they didn't never got conservative care. They never got, you know, um, taught the right way to move and, and how to actually do the things that they need to do, whether or not that's physical therapy or whether or not it's chiropractic care or whatever, they may not, might not have gone down that path. And in general, you know, you can start off with like a person getting like higher amounts of pain meds and, you know, again, they can proceed to opioids and then the opioids proceeds to spinal injections and the spinal injections proceeds to a surgery and the surgery ends up not necessarily like working. So a couple of years later, they go back, they redo the surgery and then they do a fusion and then the fusion starts to cause degeneration and increased instability on that level, maybe above the, where the fusion was. And then a couple of years later, they need another surgery for another fusion and then things just start to you know go through and then you end up having a person that ends up having their entire lumbar spine fused and they can't move and then obviously there's a whole lot of pain that gets associated with that so there's multiple different problems that obviously like go with that and again some people are going to go down those pathways but the idea is is that you want to try to avoid it as much as you can and what it comes down to is, is that conservative care is going to be doing things that are not injections, that are not drugs like over the counter or like whether or not they're over the counter or not, but not over the counter medications or pain medications or opioids or having people that are basically, you know, like the, the possibility of developing an addiction and different stuff like that. 
um, surgeries, all those other kind of things are not conservative care. So massage could be one thing, acupuncture could be another thing, um, chiropractic care and the, the various different things that, that exercise that a chiropractor will do, physical therapy, um, massage therapy. There's a whole handful of different things that can happen in conservative care that can help get somebody better. And the, the intention of talking about the surgeries and stuff like that is not really to scare you. And I don't want to say that spinal surgeons don't know what they're doing because obviously they, you know, they're smart people. Um, they're brilliant at what they do, but they don't always necessarily, you know, it, it, people aren't necessarily always making the best decisions based on w- what someone's doing. So um, the general idea is to try to help people understand a couple of different things with this to make, um, to let you make a better educated decision about your health. So, you know, the general idea is, is that again, surgery is something that people sometimes need, but I would exhaust your options before having surgery you know, once you cut, you can't take it back. So what it comes down to is, is that with having surgery, you know, you, you, people could have like lasting effects from that. And I always tell people that whenever a surgeon does recommend to have surgery, that you should probably go see another surgeon to get a second opinion, to see whether or not the other person thinks that you should too. But that's just my, my thing, the way that I look at it. So again, try to do all conservative kind of care options first. Again, try to do everything that you can to avoid being that 5% that really needs the surgery. Uh, And again, what it comes down to um, is, you know, it's not just like the, 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 the idea of going down the rabbit hole of doing stuff with conservative care is that there's not just is that going to be a better option for your general health and well-being, but it's also better for your wallet too. You know, from a financial standpoint, again, conservative care is like it, and basically it's it's general. It's I would say that it's a fact that if you can go conservative care and you can manage the pain or you can resolve the pain, that's going to be better than trying to go down a surgical pathway. Um, you know, again, there are options. There are different uh, times where you might need surgery, but um, in general, that that's the way that I would look at it. So let's talk a little bit about the spine. <clears throat> so again, this is like spinal hygiene 101 kind of stuff. So in order to kind of really talk about that, you need to get an idea about some of the structures that are in the spine. So this isn't going to be like a super in-depth uh, thing. Um, you know, if I had everybody here, um, you know, and we had multiple people, you know, like we had like more of an audience kind of a thing. I get out like my models and we could talk about some of this and I'll, I'll try to show them here a little bit. But, you know, the look here is that if you have something like this, this is showing an idea. Let me go get a model so I can show you here in a second. So the general idea is, is that when you start talking about the spine, again, this is a spinal column. So this is looking at the spine on the side, right? So this is the front, this would be the back, and this would be looking at the spine from the front, okay? Um, Obviously all the way up at the top, it's not being shown here, but you would end up having a noggin. You'd end up having um, something that's going to, uh, again, be the skull. And obviously you can think about what that protects. Obviously it protects your brain, it protects your brain stem, that kind of stuff. So obviously that's vital. Then the spinal cord is going to make its way down in through here, right? And then it's going to have little branches that come out. So the branches that are on the side are going to be the spinal nerves. The spinal cord is going to come down to a certain point. The spinal cord ends, and then it basically becomes what's called the cauda equina, or it's called the horse's tail. So that's going to kind of move its way down through here, and it goes all the way through this bottom part, which is the sacrum, and then the coccyx or the tailbone that's at the bottom. So again, all of this stuff is going to pass through this backside through here where you end up having, you know, this is where the spinal cord is actually going to sit. The stuff that's at the front are where the bodies are. And that's the general kind of idea with that. So again, spinal nerves come off on the side. Let's just kind of give you an idea of where some of that stuff is. So again, this would be an example of a model that I have. So this is the front of it. This is where the disc is. This is where the body is. If you look and you bring it on the side, that's right here. It's Hopefully this uh, this will reflect and it shows like it like it does over here on this uh, model here, 
right? So this is the body that's up in the front. This is the disc, again, another body. This is the spinous process that's in the back. The spinal cord is right in through here. Obviously, it's only shown two segments, so everything would be protected normally anyway. And when you look in the back part of the spine here, and this one is a little bit of a clear kind of a, of a model for the back, but you can see that where the two different things are going to connect, this, let's see if we can get a little bit closer, this is what's called a facet joint. So you can end up getting movement that will happen. So when somebody gets adjusted, the adjustment is actually happening because you end up getting a movement of one of these joints. And then you end up getting a popping when that kind of thing opens up. So hopefully you could actually hear that little pop. And this one's got a little suction cup that actually does it, which is a neat little model. This thing is like amazing. But um, this is basically the idea of what happens. So you end up having the spine. The spine is going to be one of the things that helps to coordinate with the brain, but it also has its own little control system in and of itself. But you end up having multiple different functions that are going to occur through the brain, the brain stem, the spinal cord, and it basically is going to be the control system that you end up having in the body. Okay. So that's the general kind of stuff when, when it comes to that. Now, when it talks about posture, and again, we could get into like a whole bunch of different stuff and the stuff on anatomy for the spine could end up taking weeks to get through all the stuff. So we're not going to get super in depth on it, but in general, when it comes to the posture system, the posture system is going to be something that has to do with two main functions, right? One is gonna be protection and the other one is gonna be resisting gravity. And the way that you end up having the different parts of, of the, the spine where it's gonna be doing that is that the, the, the postural system is gonna be interacting with the bones of the cervical spine up here in the neck, the thoracic spine, which is in the mid back, and then the lumbar spine, you're gonna have each of those different things are gonna interact. And then those are protecting basically the integrity of the nervous system. So where the nerves come out, where the nerves go to different muscles and different objects and different stuff like that. The second part is obviously resisting gravity. And this is the main part that, you know, people think of when you talk about it, the protection is more really the bone, but the muscles holding things in place um, and it is going to be something that can affect the nervous system. But when it comes to resisting gravity, um, again, the part of the posture is basically holding your body upright. So you want to protect the integrity of the nervous system. You want to make sure that um, you end up having um, the body being held up against gravity in, in the correct way. So there's certain things that you can get with the, the, the system is that you end up having like an ideal kind of posture that somebody should be in. There's, you know, things that are going to be textbook and, and what should happen when it comes down to it is that you end up having certain textbook issues that are going to end up being there. So besides the being textbook, you also have some other issues when it comes to distortion patterns. So the body is pretty dynamic. There's a lot of different information that's coming in and out. And the postural system is obviously going to hold you upright. Things can get changed and you can end up having problems with misalignments or things not moving the way that they should or things being stuck. Again, the body can move around those different pot types of postural misalignments and they can create compensations. So again, you can be upright, you can get stabilized when it comes to this. And again, it'll prevent you from falling if you end up having one of these compensations. But again, if it doesn't get fixed, and those different distortions end up not getting fixed, then over time, you basically get an uneven wear on the system. You end up having a lack of like harmony with the different parts of the joint where one side might be getting too much pressure. The other side might have a muscle that is weak and it's not doing its job. The other side might have a muscle that is too contracted and too, um, too stiff. So there can be different problems with that. And then over time, you can end up having you know, damage, you can have degeneration. Some of that stuff might actually become more permanent because of like posture, like the neck coming out forward and having issues with the back of the neck and how it affects different areas of the body. So you can even have issues with problems with herniated discs where the spine will actually have the center part of the disc will actually herniate. The center part of the disc is basically like this jelly-like structure and it can actually 
herniate out through the disc and it can go into different places. And that can obviously be really, really painful. So basically there's a bunch of different stuff that's there. Um, and you know, the, the general idea is, is that if things are aligned again, some things can be elongated and weak and some things are going to be tight and short. So that's the general idea. And then exercise is going to be one of those things that can affect it, but exercise is not going to fix the problem all alone. Again, you have multiple different things that, that can obviously go with that. So, you know, when you go through, you know, the, but basically it's not just, I guess the best way to look at it is, is that exercise isn't going to be the only thing that fixes it because if something is off or if something is not moving correctly in the first place, and then you make it stronger, then you just reinforce or you strengthen the problematic posture or the problematic movement, right? So if somebody isn't balanced and they end up doing something that is, you know, imbalanced side to side, and they end up having more movement on the right than they do on the left, and every time that they do it, they, you know, increase the strength of that, obviously you want to try to see if you can set work on fixing the alignment and make everything work a little bit better before you start to contract muscles and make everything stronger, if that makes sense. So again, if you can treat things and correct the alignment, again, whether or not it's the hips, the spine, whatever it is, and make sure that the load is equal on both sides, then the muscles contract more evenly. There ends up being like not like the, there is no imbalance when things end up being even. Um, and then you can go to a yoga class and then things can get more flexible or things can get stronger. And you can do that because you've kind of like helped to fix some of those muscular compensation patterns. So when I talk about the exercise, again, the exercise in this situation is going to the gym and doing a bunch of different exercises. It's not talking about doing your rehab because your rehab is gonna be things that are specifically targeted in order to help you get to the point where you're getting rid of those compensation patterns and those distortions, okay? So in order to correct the postural problems, you need to collect and correct some of the different problems with the alignment in the system. So again, you end up having um, problems with the way that the pelvis moves or you end up having some kind of traumatic injury or uh, those different kind of things. You need to try to correct some of those loads first before you start to load them and get them stronger, right? Um, so correcting posture alignment, some of those are going to be exercises, pulling your head back, pulling your shoulders back, standing correctly so that your butt's basically not sticking way out. Um, there's things that can be there. Um, exercises can be done in order to stretch things that are tight, um, and inhibit things that are tight using different exercises. Like, um, I do something called Graston technique. There's other myofascial release techniques so that will help to inhibit tight muscles and then you help to stretch them. And then at the same time, the muscles that are weak, which are usually the opposite muscles that are tight, those should end up needing to be strengthened. So for example, if you're talking about me, if you're talking about like my shoulders, if my shoulders are way up here like this on a regular basis, then you're going to end up having a lot of tightness in the levator and the trapezius muscles that are up here on the top. So when you end up having all that lifting up, the muscles that pull the shoulders down have the tendency to be weak. These end up being tight. So in general, you need to work on getting these to relax, which is, you know, exercises, uh, like which is stretches and it's, you know, getting in there and doing like myofascial release or massage or grass and technique or different stuff like that, getting in there and breaking those things up and then working the exercises to pull the shoulders down so that when you pull the shoulders down, as those get stronger, it helps to kind of shut down these muscles and stop you from like, you know, having your uh, shoulders up in your ears. Okay. So Different things with postural correction, again, spinal alignment, trying to work on postural rehabilitation, and then trying to help to fix that posture in general. So again, this is the general idea of how this whole office operates, is that we're trying to realign the spine. And again, some of it can also be from adjusting too, because when you do an adjustment, again, you're going to be moving a bone pretty quickly, but it helps to kind of like re you know, and again, this is simplified language 
you know, let, let me get that straight. It's basically helping bones to move more properly. And when they move more properly, then exercises can actually be a little bit more effective. So um, again, you look for different types of misalignments. You try to correct them. You try to do some different postural rehabilitation exercises in order to correct the muscles and then do other kinds of postural exercises in order to get things stronger. So those are the general types of steps. So these posture patterns is that this is like, you know, again, it depends on the person, but these postural distortions and the postural patterns that people can have, again, everything gets a little bit different with, with different people. But again, you can see two different people or the same person, but in two different postural kind of positions. And let's say that the person comes in. And if you look at this person over here, where do you think the back or where do you think the pain is? Right. You know, it could be in a couple of different positions, but, you know, like they could be in the neck, it could be in the low back. But if the person comes in and they say that they've got low back pain and they don't necessarily have the best posture, just because you don't have the best posture here, do you think that this could be affecting their low back pain? And it can actually. What's interesting is, is that by taking your head and moving your head forward a little bit, and this is one of those little things that you can actually like palpate you can actually feel it on your own back that if you have your head and back a little bit and if you are touching your back if you kind of like bend forward you know and especially if you're feeling it on somebody else you can actually feel a person's back contract more when their head's out front because if this person's head is out front here the weight is pulling it forward and the muscles have to contract harder in order to pull it back so pulling someone's chin back and getting the posture right up in the upper part of the body can actually do some things in order to take load off of the low back, which is an interesting thing here. So just because a person complains of pain in one spot doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to fix posture in general, right? So obviously I'm gonna to try to evaluate the entire body for different kind of distortion patterns. Again, some people don't want to necessarily work on their neck. I mean, if they don't wanna work on their neck later, I'll help them fix it You know, when they're finally ready to get there. But again, the, it could be a disservice to somebody if you're not really correcting the entire pattern at once. So um, you know, again, you wanna to try to find the best care possible and try to do the best types of things in order to stop somebody from having surgery if you can. So, um, you know, there's different examples, all kinds of different stuff here. I'm one of those kind of people where when I go out and I people watch, I'm watching people's posture. Like that's my thing. I know, I, I know some people will like look at different stuff and, you know, graphic designers will like look at like how, you know, like the, how like the, like banners and like the spacing of the letters and stuff like that. I look for people's posture. When you see this kind of stuff, you know, you start looking at having, all right, how much does it hurt in their upper back here? How bad are their headaches? You know, like she's going to have migraines and all this other kind of stuff. And everybody like with their head being forward and again, the rounding and all this other kind of stuff. And again, some of these are a little bit like, obviously like staged and a little bit, um, you know, dramatic. But this is the kind of stuff that people walk around with on a regular basis. And again, even with this one, the person's shoulders are rolled forward a little bit. It's just kind of funny how that kind of stuff works. This one's shoulders are still rolled forward a little bit, right? So there's a bunch of different stuff that kind of goes in there. It's just kind of interesting with how everything kind of works out with those things. So again, the way to kind of think about this is that, again, when you start looking at this, you want to try to get everybody's posture back as close as you can to like ideal is what is what you can. And again, there the the way that it kind of works is is that you have to work at it in order to actually get the posture back to where it should be, right? So the general idea is like posture is going to be by design, not by circumstance. So it's about trying to get everybody to improve their posture so that it can try to help increase the symmetry and increase how healthy that they are. And again, there's other environmental factors that a person might have that can create that. But again, trying to get rid of those roadblocks as much as you can. So the specific tips of what we have that when we're going through this is that there's like 10 different common things that people have that, that we have that can help to cause some of these postural issues or postural collapse, if you want to call it that. So again, 
you know, each one of them will go through details uh, about it, you know, and give you hopefully some ideas on how to help to fix some of those things overall. So the first one that we're going to talk about, basically when it comes to this one, again, repetitive occupational movements. What it comes down to is that there, there are certain movements that people do on their jobs that you do every day, that you do extended periods of time. So again, you know, if you're talking about somebody in a factory, that's obvious what they have that's going on when it comes to the thing in a factory. They're doing a repetitive motion over and over and over again. But it's the same kind of thing of whether or not you're in a factory or whether or not you're a desk jockey. If you're sitting at a desk all day long, that seated position is going to be one of the movements that you have and how much moving are you actually doing around. So that extended period of time of having that, you know, sitting, if you're doing it day in and day out, that's going to affect your posture. So let's talk about maybe like hairdressers, for example, somebody who's a hairdresser, again, they might need to rotate their spine. They might need to reach out and get, grab some scissors or do something depending on what it is. You know, again, somebody that's switching from um, clippers in some cases or scissors, or if they're using a razor or whatever it is, they'll use something for a little while. They're doing positions where they're moving and they're doing stuff where even the movement of what they're doing with their hand and how they actually clip and the type of scissors that they have can actually contribute to carpal tunnel and other kinds of things, which is crazy enough as it is. It's the position of their body and whether or not they're bent forward when they're doing it. If they have, you know, if they're not bringing somebody up to the level that they need to do it at, and they're actually like crouching down to get into that position, all of those different things can end up having effects on the person and how they end up having problems. And again, if they're going through and they're reaching for their scissors, you know, again, something simple like making their scissors like in arm's reach or having something that they can stick or a magnet or whatever it is that they can use in order to hold the scissors so that they don't have to like lean over and reach over and maybe do bad and like have a, a bad type of posture. Again, there's different things that you can do to change. So one is going to be trying to modify those movements, right? So another one would be like a gardener, right? So if a gardener is going to be on their knees uh, for an extended period of time and they're being bent forward, um, you know, again, you can strain the low back that way if you're not trying to keep your back straight. And if the back is kind of rounded out and not straightened out when a person's doing uh, some of these, that can be problematic. Or maybe that they're raking the yard and they're bending forward when they're raking a person's yard. Again, doing those movements for you know a few hours a day or whatever, obviously that kind of stuff can build up for a person. So the way that you would help to kind of fix some of these things is obviously modifying the movement. So if you can take that movement and modify it so that it's not performed incorrectly when they do it, or if it's in a better spinal position when the person's doing it, again, there's a difference when you bend forward, if you bend forward and your low back actually rounds out, that's actually not a good thing if you're doing it multiple times a day. If you bend forward once to touch your toes and your low back rounds, that's not a problem. But when you bend forward, if your back is going to basically straight and it stays there when you're here, and then when you go to bend forward, as you bend forward, if your back stays straight, that's actually the position that you want to be in. It's the strongest position you know, to be in. The other thing is, is that sometimes people will end up having some kind of movement that they might not be able to avoid. So sometimes doing the opposite movement is actually something that can be a good thing for them. So a person that's bending forward all day long, or they're sitting all day long, in some cases, and again, you can't just go off and do it and hopefully see what happens. I mean, you can, but you can hurt yourself. So but sometimes what a person might need to do is they might need to do extension exercises where they stand up and they put their hands on their back and they basically arch back in order to get a increased extension in their lumbar spine. Sometimes you can do that when you're on the ground and push yourself up into a, a position where your hips are on the ground and your hands are straightened out and you're arched up kind of like a cobra would be um, or an upward dog would be um, if you were doing yoga. So there's a couple of different things that are like that, that those can be helpful. The next one would be a sedentary lifestyle. So somebody that ends up having a sedentary lifestyle is going to have problems because the joints are going to get stiff. The muscles are going to get stiff. Again, movement is going to end up being painful in somebody who isn't moving very much. So movement is a good thing in general. Again, if you have too much movement and it's causing a wear and tear on the joints, that can be problematic. But if you're talking about having a movement where you're going into something and 
you are doing a movement that's well within your range and well within your tolerance and all that other kind of stuff, movement is a good thing. Um, in general, uh, there, there's, um, when it comes to that, you know, if you're not moving, you know, and you're sedentary all the time, it ends up being this vicious little cycle of the lack of moving makes you not want to move and then not wanting to move. And if you're not going through that pathway, it ends up being problematic and then not wanting to move ends up leading to pain. So, and then now you end up having more pain. So now you don't want to move as much. And then it ends up just being, so people get to the point where they actually get afraid of moving because they think that they're going to hurt themselves. And, you know, there's, some cases where that might happen, somebody that has a really hot low back that's like super, super, super tender. Yeah. But most of the time people can do little movements and it doesn't necessarily need to be fully bending and touching your toes. That might not be what you need to do, but some people just get to the point where they're like, they're just frozen. And that creates this process that ends up being problematic. One of the things that helps to make pain go away is moving joints. And one of the, you know, basically you know, the big people that um, in like, basically like movement science and like uh, rehabilitation and stuff like that. One of the things that I've heard him mention over and over again is the motion is the lotion basically for your joints. So the idea of like moving those joints and moving those muscles is basically lubricating the joints. It's lubricating the cartilage. It's basically stimulating your brain because when movement tries to get through at the same time that pain does, your brain doesn't do a very good job at feeling the pain. So it's like if you, you know, if a kid rolls their ankle when they're playing sports, a lot of times the coach will just be like, walk it off, you know, and if they can't, then there's usually a problem. But a lot of times somebody will roll their ankle they'll go and they'll walk it off for a little while and then they're able to go back and be able to get back into the game because they're not hurt it's but it's that movement ends up helping decrease the pain so the ill effects that you end up having with having a let like with this sedentary lifestyle it makes it to the point where some people will talk about how sitting is basically like the new smoking. So, you know, if you think about it, if somebody is sitting and they're sitting at their job and they're all day sitting, then they sit on their way to drive to work, right? They're sitting on the drive to work and from work. They're sitting all day at work. So eight hours, and they're probably doing multiple hours at a time without getting up, you know, where you should be getting up maybe every 20, 30 minutes, they're sitting for a couple hours at a time. And then what do they do when they go home? They go home, they sit and they eat dinner. They sit and they watch them, you know, like a TV program or like they watch a movie or they bust out Netflix or something like that. Or they sit on their phone and they just like are slumped up. And again, they've been sitting all day long. Their spine is in flexion and it causes problems. So again, exercise is fundamental to kind of like health and well-being in general, again, like mental health and everything else, you know, the number of runners that run, not because they love running, but just so that they don't go crazy um, is kind of like a high number. Um, a lot of them, it's like their therapy is like them running and, you know, and them moving ends up being that same kind of thing with a lot of guys that guys and girls that work out is that when they go and they work out, the workout is something that they're doing because the movement is something that helps to kind of like, you know, decrease anxiety and decrease some of the, you know, different issues that they might have, depression, whatever, right? Again, I'm not saying that everybody's going to be fixed by going and doing bench press and stuff like that if they're depressed, but that's definitely something that plays a role in that, right? So if you're sitting all day, your metabolism drops. And if your metabolism drops, it makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to put on weight. So you eat the same amount, you don't move as much, your metabolism drops, and then you start putting on the pounds. There's a recent study that I saw that showed that your metabolism doesn't drop when you age, other than maybe like when you get after like, you know, I think it was like 75 years old or something like that, that your metabolism doesn't drop as you get older. The problem is, is that you don't move as much, right? My eight-year-old and my seven-year-old aren't going to be seven. My eight-year-old and my six-year-old, those two are going to be running around all the time and you can't keep them still. It doesn't matter if it's cold out or whether or not it's hot out. They want to go and they want to run outside. They want to play, right? You move, you know, like as life goes on, your people get more content and they have the, the ability to sit more, right? You know, because what are you going to do? Grandma comes in and you want grandma, oh, everybody, you're going to move and let grandma have her seat and she's going to sit down. You know, 
as opposed to moving around. Again, it depends on the situation. It depends on the person. But, you know, grandma still needs to get up and she needs to move and she needs to carry stuff and do different stuff like that. Right. It's a good thing to take care of grandma. But grandma needs to make sure that she's doing that on her own, too, because that's the kind of pattern that you get into is that somebody that doesn't move, they get worse at moving. And if you're worse at moving and then things start to go wrong, like your balance starts to be horrible. And, you know, grandma now, you know, she doesn't want to walk as much. So then she stops going up the stairs as much. And then she starts losing muscle mass because she's not going up the stairs and after she's not going up the stairs as much now, she wants to move to a house that doesn't even have stairs. And then after a little while, she ends up having a hard time standing up out of a chair at all. And then you end up having horrible balance. Your muscles can't contract and fire and be strong enough. And then grandma falls and he breaks the hip and she breaks the hip. And then obviously that's not good after that. Right. So there's a kind of a pattern that happens with all this. So moving, exercising, doesn't matter what age you are, is always going to be a good thing. So, again, exercise is a good thing. Making sure that you're trying to take care of your spine using posture breaks. So, again, getting up, standing up every 20 to 30 minutes because it helps to lengthen out contracted muscles and it helps to um pull everything back to where it should be. So whether or not it's standing up and like, you know, bending backwards or whether or not it's pulling your shoulders back and opening up your arms, trying to like, you know, lifting up your chest and stuff like that. Again, there's certain exercises that you can do that can open things up. One of them is called Bruger's Postural Relief Exercise. Um, I have a, uh, on YouTube, I have a video, which is the, basically about treatment for upper cross syndrome, which is some of the stuff that we're talking about today. And it's an in-depth, uh, basically, review of what happens with uh, some of these exercises. So there's a couple of things that kind of go with that. So the next one is going to be sitting. So when it comes to sitting, we talked a little bit about some of this stuff. But again, sitting, when it comes down to it, you got to sit right. So that posture that you have that's not necessarily great, if you're sitting poorly, then it just makes everything even worse. So the general idea is, is that one of the causes of spinal degeneration, it goes with that sedentary lifestyle, is going to be that improper posture while you're seating for, sitting for prolonged periods. Now, you can see that the picture is something in through here. One of the ways that you can help to improve somebody's posture is to have somebody sit on something like a medicine ball or like a gym ball or something like that. Um, obviously people don't do this, um, as much. Um, I don't know how often people actually do it in like the real world. I know that we talk about it in, you know, chiropractic and rehab that people will do this, but I don't think it is popular now as what it was. And I don't think that somebody should be on one of these all day long, but it's one way that you can actually actively like work while you're actually like working. Right. So you can actually work your muscles in your, in your back and like fire out some and have some stability in your back. Um, as opposed to just completely slouching down, but people usually get tired if you do this for too long. Another thing that you can do is you can actually sit in a full chair and in the chair, you can end up having like a lumbar roll that sits here that causes a person to kind of like arch over top of it and they can relax into that position, but then the, the position that they're in is actually still decent for the spine, right? So, but again, there's a difference between when you're standing and when you're sitting. So you end up having the different parts of the spine that we had talked about before, right? So when you stand, some of the weight is going to be carried through the vertebral body that's in the front, but you stand, you're also going to be carrying some of the weight in through here into the back part. When a person sits and your butt kind of tucks under, you have the tendency to flex forward in the spine. And when you flex forward in the spine a little bit, the weight comes off of the back structures and everything goes onto the disc in the front. So when you end up having that, it's one of those where like your body, like the normal body weight that you would have that, that's on there, you increase the pressure on the disc by about 1.7 times what your body weight is just by rolling forward and sitting in that in a not great position. So again, and if you slouch even more, then that pressure increases even more. So the idea is, is that you can 
tolerate sitting in a slouched position for maybe about 20 minutes at a time before the discs start getting more pressure and you start getting more problems and things start progressing from there. Okay, so there's a, you know, here's a general kind of idea of like different kinds of stuff with seated posture. So you can see in this kind of picture that's here, my mouse needs to work, in the person's head being forward, you end up having uh, stress on the shoulders or the upper back, you know, the spine ends up being rounded forward as opposed to being straight up. The wrist can end up having impact if you're like holding them up and all that. So these are all things that are like wrong with, you know, having bad sitting posture. Whereas on the other hand, like again, a person that is sitting in a sitting position, um, if the monitor is like angled up and you end up having the monitor lifted so the person isn't having to look down quite as far, you know, the arms end up being supported on a chair that ends up having um, armrests, that ends up being a big deal. Again, having the hips be in about at 90 and having something to actually put your feet up on that can rest, uh, that's basically a foot rest. So there's a bunch of different things that are there um, that are possible. And again, this is another option. If you have the ability to actually, like whether or not you're working from home or you have the ability in your office to actually have a standing desk, this is one of the reasons why I actually made a standing desk in my office so that when I'm talking to patients is that I can be standing as opposed to sitting. It's going to increase my metabolism. It's going to help me burn, burn more calories during the day. It's going to make sure that I'm in an extended position as I stand so that it's not going to be as bad on my low back. So again, same kind of stuff happens. Again, notice that it's the same kind of posture that's here. You just don't have an armrest, but everything is going to be standing and you, know, you can move around a little bit and stuff like that, but you can get those core muscles activated and help that support that spine a little bit better. Okay. So the next thing to talk about is slouching when it comes to things like text neck and stuff like that. And again, you just look at this entire thing that's here is that her neck is bent forward. His neck is way bent forward, you know, and everybody's like getting closer to their phone as they're going through and they're doing that. And that causes a lot of stress on the back of the neck, causes things with headaches. It causes things with, you know, upper back pain and ribs. Like in between your shoulder blades, people can have ribs that will end up going out and those can be like horribly painful. Um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that's there. So again, reading, watching TV, you know, again, if you're just texting, if you're watching a movie on your phone or typing on your computer or when you're driving and you're slumped forward and you're doing that, again, there's a bunch of different things that's there. And again, it feels like it's a better position when you're just kind of relaxed in there initially. But what happens is, is that over time, things continue to creep and creep and creep and they get worse and worse and worse. And you're being lazy, sorry, but people are being lazy by just relaxing on their ligaments. And if you relax on your ligaments over time, what will happen is, is that the ligaments start to move and things start to shift. Just like if you add pressure to a tooth over time with braces, you can actually pull a tooth through somebody's jaw, right? The same kind of thing can happen if you're talking about bad posture over time is that it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So the idea is that you want to try to actually engage the muscles in order to pull somebody up in order to get them into a good position with their shoulders up and back and everything kind of balanced so that the people don't have nearly as many problems, right? So again, Slouching forward, again, your body's getting compressed by gravity. If you do it for a super long period of time, you start getting different kinds of compression and problem on some of the vertebral discs. And again, you can end up having a lot of stuff that can go wrong with that. So there's different things that you can do in order to kind of like help to fix things. So when it comes down to it, you know, this kind of posture that you can have on her, again, her shoulders and everything being rounded forward here. Again, it affects her low back down at the bottom. When you're slumped here, she's leaning back and rolled forward. And again, it happens where you end up getting a lot of tightness and pain that can happen in the front part of the chest with the pec minor and the pectoralis muscles that are in the front of the chest. Um, again, notice that her abdomen is basically being stretched out when you're in that position, because you lean back and you're rolled forward and, and certain, and everybody carries themselves a little bit differently. But again, when you pull up again at the beginning, when you're not used to it, things can get a little bit sore, but over time, your body will start to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you end up not having quite as much pain. So some of it is actively doing it. Other things are trying to like actively like 
stretch the chest. So here's an example of a chest stretch that you can have. There's two different ones. One is going in a doorway and you put your elbows on either side of the doorway, put your elbows like that, and then kind of step through the doorway, not bend forward, but step through it and it'll pull your shoulders back and it'll help to stretch out that pec major. That's one thing. This picture that's over here is showing somebody that's lying on a foam roller. So one of the ones like the long tube kind of things where they have their butt sitting on it, they have their shoulders and it's just lying along their spine and it's letting them stretch out. And that'll help get into the pec major a little bit. You can get into the pec minor as well. So there's a bunch of different stuff. And again, those stretches, you want to hold a stretch for like 30 seconds. If you're holding it for 15 seconds, you're actually wasting your time because your body will tighten up with the different reactions that you end up having. Just like if you tap somebody's reflex in their arm jerks or their leg jerks, when you stretch something, you actually will tighten things up and make it so that you're actually um, causing problems. If you don't stretch it for long enough, you need to get rid of that whole reflex that will tighten up the muscle. And you need to do that for at least 30 seconds when you do a stretch. So a five second stretch or a 10 second stretch doesn't work. Okay. Um, so when it comes to different kinds of things with purses and handbags, holding things in the wrong position, again, um, having a bag over one shoulder, right? So if you've got a heavy purse or wearing a book bag and the book bag is way overloaded, like it is on her. And if it's just on one shoulder, again, people will end up having this. I've seen a couple of, you know, like, I'm not going to sit there and say that I've seen like all kinds of crazy people in concert, but seeing James Taylor in concert and seeing, uh, Paul Simon in concert, the thing that I'm watching them, and again, me being the posture guy, is that when they don't have the guitar, it's fairly obvious that the person is a right-handed person that plays guitar, right? Because if you look at them when they're standing, their shoulder will be up like this because they're always getting that shoulder up so that they can get the guitar in the right spot. So if somebody that does play guitar, you need to make sure that the strap is in the right position and you're not trying to do this all the time in order to stop it from you know, falling off or whatever. So again, purses, handbags, guitars, all of those kind of things. Again, you need to make sure that you have things evened out so that things are in the right places. You know, again, the bag is pulling that shoulder down. And when your body starts to do that and you start to lean and you have multiple different things, you raise the shoulder, you roll it forward sometimes and you cause other kinds of problems, right? So again, if you can put both sides on or if you can strap it, that's, you know, where it connects it in the front. Um, you know, sometimes people will do the rollers. Um, those can be helpful as well. It always depends on the person and the situation and all that other kind of stuff, but there's some stuff that's in through there. The other thing is, is that's important is the different stuff with lifting because lifting and trying to lift and you know, lifting a load is important. Now, the thing that's important about this is that notice when the person is bending the entire time they're bending. This is what it means when, when somebody says to lift with your legs and not lift with your back, this is what they mean. If you look at the person's spine, when the person's doing this is that notice that the spine is straight the entire time, maybe a little bit of a curve there going this way. It's not rounded forward, right? So if you end up having a situation where a person does one of these, and when they're all the way at the bottom, maybe the, they're not leaning enough, you can always bend your spine and roll forward so you can get a little bit further down. That ends up being problematic. And that is the type of repetitive motion that will cause a disc to blow. Doing it once isn't going to do it, but doing it over and over and over again, or doing it and having, you know, a lot of times the thing that's crazy is, is that, you know, if this is a book box that somebody has, that's usually going to be pretty heavy, right? People usually don't hurt themselves on things that are, heavier, right? They're usually either getting a friend to do it or they're getting help and they can, but a lot of times the way that it works is that the person bends forward to pick up the pen. And when they pick up the pen, it's just their body weight and how they flex and how they do that. Again, those are all kinds of, kinds of issues that you need to be aware of. So in order to protect your spine, you want to try to keep this spine straight when it comes back and forth here, not round it forward, not bend forward like that. So, and again, if you're bending forward and you're doing it with your low back, it's not only is it not, I mean, it is a lazier way of doing it, but people feel like it's more efficient because they can just do that and get it done as opposed to going through all of the horrible things of actually bending their knees and actually bending their hips and getting all the way down, right? So 
in general, like this is one of those kind of things like, you know, again, if you've been a patient and you want to have this looked at and you, know, you want me to see whether or not you can do it, it, this is an easy one to do to see how well that you do it. I'll actually take a stick and put it on your back and have you bend forward and see how far down that you can get without the stick popping up and moving the wrong way. So this is an easy thing that you can do if you want to come in and get it looked at. Okay. So um, women have issues with purses and, you know, bags and stuff like that. And students, obviously, guys have the tendency to have issues with wallets, right? So again, while there ends up being, you know, different issues with that, sitting on your wallet can be something that can cause a problem. So, you know, imagine taking like a couple of magazines and like sticking in under one side of like your sits bones. That's going to basically cause you to shift and it's going to shift it off a little bit and it causes you to get a little bit of torque in your pelvis. So it's not necessarily going to be the main thing that's going to cause all of the problems, but it's something that can contribute to people that end up having low back pain. So when it comes to people that end up, you know, if you're using a wallet on a regular basis, you know, again, one is get a smaller wallet, get a, you know, got to make sure that you guys can't see any of my info on here, right? But you can get like a Ridge wallet or something like that that ends up having like a slimmer type of profile than something that's big and huge that, you know, really gets you to move. Um, I got one of these Ridge wallets for Christmas, so, you know, maybe, you know, at the beginning of the year or something like that. I actually like it. Seems like it does a pretty good job. But um, yeah, and I'm not sponsored by them. But when it comes down to it, you know, making sure that the wallet is right and then where you know using the wallet and putting the wallet in your front pocket when you go to sit so you can either have it in the front pocket all the time which is actually a better position if people are trying to pickpocket you just by the way because back pocket is easier for people to get but if you are wearing it in the front pocket then when you go to sit down you're not sitting on it and that's the better position for it to be in okay so that's one thing. Another thing that you can end up having that can affect posture is a physical trauma. So again, sports injuries, you know, this guy getting hit from behind as a quarterback, um, a, a car accident, different stuff like that. Again, you obviously want to do what you can in order to avoid a preventable injury. Like you want to wear your seatbelt when you're in your car, you want to wear your helmet when you're playing football, right? So the idea is, is that regardless of the situation, things happen and you can't always control when something is going to happen. So a good way to do it is make sure that your body is in good shape beforehand so that you can actually do a better job recovering afterwards, right? So the, the stronger that you are, the stronger that your spine is, you know, I do think that people that get adjusted on a regular basis have the tendency to bounce back after they do have an injury. But for all of those different things, if you're doing, you know, different types of training, you can actually, um, you know, if you're doing exercise, if you're already working on your posture, if you're doing other kinds of stuff, a person that is working out is going to do a better job and usually recover faster than somebody who is really, really sedentary and overweight and has a bunch of different issues, right? That's just kind of how it goes. Um, so obviously there's things that you can do with, you know, working on a postural reha rehabilitation program. Um, you know, for one example, like that you can do for, um, you know, this, which everybody can benefit from is working on balancing on one leg. Now you got to be careful, right? When it comes to balancing on one leg, you know, you can go fancy and you can go like tree pose and yoga and stuff like that of like what it's showing here. But when it comes to doing that, you, all you need to do is find a corner, right? So that you can put your hands up on it and like balance if you need to, but you take your hands off the wall taking, you know, like you get the corner of the room or whatever, you go into the room and you just basically stand there and you try to pick your foot up and just try to balance and hold that balance for, let's say, you know, in an ideal world with your eyes open, you should be able to hold that for at least 30 seconds. And your foot shouldn't be doing this all over the place when you're trying to do that kind of balancing. So you obviously have to be careful. I don't want anybody to fall and get hurt. You know, if you need somebody to spot you, that's great. But if you start to lose your balance a little bit, you can reach out and grab the wall if you're using the corner. So usually that's going to be safe. If your balance is horrible and you can't stand on, you know, two feet, then obviously not trying to stand on one isn't going to really work, right? But you can strengthen your core when you're holding that position. Um, again, your lumbar spine is going to be protected. You know, the more often that you do that kind of stuff, it can help prevent falls. 
And again, it can strengthen your core. Again, people that are getting better at it and can hold it for the full 30 seconds, you know, maybe you don't need to be on the wall as much, but maybe you can kind of swing your leg back and forth for the other one, right? Maybe you can, you know, move your hands back and forth or somebody can throw a ball or even you can bounce a ball off of a brick wall and just like a tennis ball and try to like catch it while you're standing on one leg, right? So these are things that you can do. If you get really good at it, you know, you could do something, you know, a little bit harder to do. You got to be careful, but you can do something a little bit harder, like stand on like a pillow or a couch cushion. So that's going to have a little bit more wobble to it, or you can even close your eyes. Right. And again, closing your eyes, if your balance is horrible, you risk falling. So you got to make sure that you're careful with it, but you can, you know, balance hands on the wall right about there close your eyes. And then if you fall, you can actually like reach out and touch the wall. Um, so there's different things that you can do. And those are some examples of how you can balance. That's going to be good postural control. It's going to be making sure everything is stacked up the right way. And again, if you can prevent a fall later on because you are actually working on your balance, that is not a bad thing at all. Okay. So when it comes down to it, again, uh, making sure that you're wearing supportive shoes, high heels are not going to be a supportive type of a shoe. Um, high heels basically shift everything, all the weight up onto the ball of the foot. When you shift onto the ball of the foot, it makes you kind of like stick your butt out when you do it. And that's the reason why people actually wear them. You don't, people don't really think about it, but when people wear high heels, they have the tendency to make a, a, a person stick their butt out a little bit more, which basically makes a person's but and their legs look maybe a little bit better. So that's part of the reason. Some people will do it, granted, trying to be taller. But the general idea is, is that that's one that's there. And probably most women that wear them on a regular basis would probably admit that their feet are going to hurt if they wear high heels for a long time. And their low back is going to hurt because they're arching and they're kind of like jamming it together. Right. So if you're doing it for a long time, most of the time people are going to admit that that's not necessarily all that great. And even worse than that would be something that's like not great, like a flip flop, like flip flops are awful. Right. You know, again, flip flops are going to be worse than like the slides that you can stick your feet into. Those aren't necessarily quite as bad. But the flip flops, because you got like just a little bit that's holding on or a thong, you know, like, you know, foot piece of like that's what you're talking about. But if you're putting your, um, if you're putting your foot into a flip-flop in order for you to hold on to it, you basically have to contract your toes in order to make sure that the flip-flop doesn't go flying off. So that's different kind of tone that you have in your toes as things are kind of like flying through. It changes the muscular firing patterns and that is going to change your posture. So uh, dress shoes or flat type of shoes, th those can be things that, you know, that might not have great arch support. If a person has weak feet, that might be something that can cause an issue as well. So, you know, sometimes, you know, your the way that you're standing on your foot or the way that your foot actually moves can have an impact up the chain. So the way that you can kind of look at it is, is that if your foundation is messed up, then you might get a leak in the roof right? Same kind of thing happens. If your foot is messed up and if your foot doesn't move the way that it's supposed to, that can cause problems as well. So there's a couple of different things that are there. When you talk about this one showing feet, but we're talking about standing up posture. If someone is standing up, sometimes the people will kind of like shift their weight over onto one hip. So if you're standing up and you're kind of like putting all of your weight off on your right, or if like you're holding a baby and you're sticking your left hip out and you're putting all of your weight on your right hip, again, those are postures that people kind of get into the habits where, you know, you're right-handed. So you want to have your right hand free so you can do stuff and you're holding the baby in the left hand and you're always kind of sticking it out there. Again, trying to decrease that as much as you can, being aware that you're doing it and trying to shift into different positions. You know, you don't have to stand stick straight all the time with 50% of your weight on one foot and 50 on the other. But you want to try to balance it out. Some of it 50%, some of it off to the right, some of it off to the left. But people will get into different habits, the way that maybe like a kitchen is set up or the way that things are, though they just get into like a habit of like leaning over and doing stuff that they're not supposed to. And, you know, like when you point it out, it's like, oh, okay, oh, you can stop that. So again, that can strain the joints, that can strain muscles, and that can cause other kinds of problems. And again, if you're not. And if you're constantly sitting with everything off to the right side, that's going to have worse postural asymmetry. You're going to basically 
diminish the ability of your posture to kind of like resist gravity. Okay. So um, another one that you can have here is the restless posture. So posture when you're sleeping, right? So that's another thing that can have an impact. So a lot of times sleeping on stomach is not a good thing. Your lumbar spine gets into extension when you do that. And sometimes, sometimes people think that it's great, but it's one of those kind of things where when you're sleeping in extension, um, sometimes that can cause problems. And again, that can strain your back, especially if you're face down, like all the way face down and your head is turned to the side, you can end up having a problem with like, you don't turn your head as far one direction as you do the other, because you're sleeping face down and you have to turn that head. Um, if you're sleeping on your side for this person, one of the ways that they can do it is to actually put a pillow in between their knees right? You can get like the full ones, like a body pillow that goes all the way down, but you can just have a pillow that's in between their knees um, in order to help kind of keep your hips separated and keep them in the right alignment. Or if you're sleeping on your back, you can take a pillow and you can put it underneath your knees um, in order to kind of take some of the, the strain off of the lumbar spine, you know? So, and again, it's one of those kind of things where, you know, sometimes it's also the mattress too, um, you know, uh, the way I look at it is, is that, you know, if you're spending, you know, you spend a third of your life on your mattress, so you should probably invest in having a good one and not just get the cheapest type of mattress that's, you know, on sale, the, you know, the bargain basement type of thing. So, you know, that's the kind of way that I look at it, but, you know, there, there's a couple of different things with that. Um, and if you are ever looking for a mattress, there is a website that I think is fantastic. It's called sleeplikethedead.com. And basically they do unbiased, like unpaid for reviews for everything, whether or not it's sleep number or, um, Sealy Posturepedic or Tempurpedic or any of those other kind of things like purple and all of the other kinds of stuff. They have like reviews on all of those. So I think that it's a really, really good website to find that kind of stuff. But again, if you're sleeping and you wake up and it's always every time that you wake up again, it could be the posture when you're asleep. It could be the, the mattress. So there's a couple of different options for that. So, you know, when you like, when you look through all of this stuff, again, there ends up being like a whole handful of different things that are there. Um, again, there's different things, making sure that you're fixing your posture when you're standing so that you end up having a straighter back again, notice the slumping in through here versus having, you know, you can have a pillow or something that's here, or you can have this back and have the, <clears throat> the arch of the back actually supported pulling the shoulders back and having everything stand, not bending here. Right. So there's a whole handful of different things that you can do in order to help with that posture type of correction. OK, so that is basically the presentation went a little bit over. Sorry about that. Um, you know, obviously, we got a little bit of time here that if anybody has any questions, uh, you are more than welcome to ask and I'll give you a second. And if not, then we'll uh, close it up. So you can unmute if you want to. Um, you know, you don't have to turn on the camera or anything like that. But um, if you have any questions about any of the stuff that we went over, uh, I'd be more than happy to take a look. Thanks for watching. I definitely appreciate it. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, obviously you can uh, give me a call, um, make an appointment, all that other kind of stuff. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye.